For some countries that have been touched by the communist regime in any way, March associates with the International Women's Day that is celebrated on the eighth day of this spring month. After the first demonstration for women's rights in America in 1909, suffragist groups in other countries followed suit and organized annual Women's Days, where they marched and protested against discrimination. It so happened that such a demonstration on the 8th of March in 1917 in Petrograd, a capital of Russian Empire, sparked massive strikes that ultimately resulted in the Russian Revolution. Naturally, the winning party commemorated the event by turning it into a public holiday. Over the years, the ideological subtext had faded, and the 8th of March became a celebration of womanhood, a tiresome chore for male colleagues and household members, and a good opportunity for flower sellers to make their yearly profit in a single day. And I decided that there is no better way to celebrate this Soviet one-sided alternative to St. Valentine's Day by reviewing a movie about a makeover and husband hunting. Well done, sister suffragette! I am Katya, and this is Soviet Movies Explained. The movie, The Most Charming and Attractive, was released in 1985 the same year that Mikhail Gorbachev came to power and announced the need to restructure the stagnating country. And although the term Perestroika would become known a bit later, this film already shows signs of breaks releasing by displaying some problematic and ridiculous aspects of Soviet reality. Written and directed by Gerald Bijanov, the film follows Nadia, a 30-plus-year-old spinster who lives with her mother and works as a design engineer at a research institute. The director tailored this role specifically for Irina Muravyova, an actress from the Academy Award-winning Moscow Doesn't Believe in Tears, who at first refused the part, having recently played a similar playing girl transformed, but eventually gave in to his prolonged siege. You might call Irina a Soviet Barbara Streisand, in no way a conventional beauty, her charisma, charm and plasticity made all her cinema and theater roles memorable and iconic. Formally, the movie also falls into the category of occupational comedies, as my previous video subject, Divchata. But the two films couldn't be more different and clearly display the shift in the mood that happened in 23 years between their releases. After the heroic strain of the post-war years, where people firmly believed that the promised communist utopia is right around the corner, one generation later, and still with no paradise in sight, they became tired and disillusioned. No longer willing to work their buns off for the abstract idea, they instead focus on personal comfort and well-being. Labor is no longer a virtue and a source of pride and joy, but a tedious chore, a time killer, and workers eagerly spend their work days gossiping, matchmaking, and doing other personal stuff. That's why Nadia's activities as a member of the trade union, gathering money for some colleague's relative's funeral, for example, is met with nothing but contempt and eye-rolling. Moreover, one of her co-workers, a music-loving good look of Alodia, sabotages his turn to patrol with their local Druzhina, neighborhood watch, leaving Nadia do the rounds with only her other female colleague for company. These semi-voluntary detachments of civilians helping the Soviet Union police forces, militia, to maintain public order, were also regulated by trade unions. Small groups, sometimes accompanied by a police officer, but most likely not, were supposed to patrol the streets or their workplaces, catch drunkards and vandals, and prevent other petty crimes. For their labors, the Druzhinniki got a snappy cuff band, extra vacation days, and, of course, certificates of honor. Thanks to Nadia's proactiveness and bravery, they indeed manage to prevent a car theft and catch the criminals, but get slightly battered themselves. Nadia is sporting a black eye and joylessly rides a late bus home when she meets her old classmate, Susanna, who invites her to catch up in a cafe. By the way, not only the saxophone player here is an unknown then but famous now Russian performer Vladimir Markin, he is playing something completely different. The melody fascination by Fermo Dante Marchetti was added in post-production. One of the signs of globalization and Soviet Union opening up was that now creators had to be more mindful of copyright. If earlier filmmakers unabashedly borrowed foreign music for their works,
and musicians made uncredited Russian covers of famous songs, This movie was one of the first examples when the director had to either get permission from the copyright owners or cut it out. They say that the director personally wrote letters to all Western performers whose music is featured in the film and succeeded in all instances except one. I'll point it out later. Susanna, who is a sociologist at a factory that makes air conditioners. Just why? Upon finding out about Nadia's non-existent love life, instructs her to take matters into her own hands and catch herself a husband, as she, Susanna, had done with the help of her knowledge of psychology. Then she demonstrates her pickup skills. Surprisingly enough, most of the scientifically proven advice that Susanna gives differs little from those in modern books on seduction. Next day, she visits Nadia at work to help her pick the best candidate to be conquered. Susanna immediately discards Gena, with whom Nadia plays table tennis every lunch break, for he is a mere technician and fails to answer her loaded, character-defining questions. Other nominees are treated in the same prudent manner. Lecha Pryakhin – job title not good enough and too ugly. Misha Dyatlov – is married, not a problem, can be made to divorce, but two daughters are too much of a hassle. Even the boss is shortly considered, but dropped due to age restrictions. This leaves only the playboy Valodia, whom Nadia owes her black eye to, but she admits to take a slight liking to him and thus his fate is sealed. It's time to mention that during the shooting relationships between the director and the cast were quite strained. Already well-established actors, they constantly questioned the authority of Bejanov, for whom it was a first major project, and ridiculed him for insisting on following the scripted text to a T. Alexander Abdulov, who played Valodia, went a wall for two weeks, and Tatiana Vasilieva dyed her hair red in the middle of making Nadia's work visit scene, that's why she's wearing a white beanie hat in some shots. Bijana was so enraged by her prank that he suffered a mild heart attack that put him into a hospital and stalled the production for more than a month. While the girls make pastures to pave the way to Valodia's heart, we might have a look at Susanna's kitchen. It might seem clashing and kitsch to you, but if you remember my story about limited choices and design hardships from this video, I can assure you, to Soviet yours, this decor was the pinnacle of taste and coziness, no doubt qualified as English or Dutch style in their books. We also meet Susanna's trophy husband, Arkady, a musician. No genius, but okay. To some of you, he might seem familiar. It's the same actor Alexander Shirvind who played the ill-fated Pavlik from the above-mentioned movie The Irony of Fate. Next step, as in any classical makeover, is to get Nadia some fashionable clothes. For this purpose, girls go not to a department store, for the selection there was as unexciting as Nadia's old life, but to a very interesting character, a fartsovshik, an illegal seller of foreign goods. The etymology of the name is debated, but one of the theories suggests that Fartsa is an extremely deformed version of for sale. I cannot say for sure, but it might be the first time when this aspect of Soviet black market that existed since the 50s was depicted outside of some satirical moralizing story, which can be seen as a harbinger of the coming glasnost, which along with Perestroika would eventually make the entire shady business redundant. Since the end of World War II, more and more Soviet people got a glimpse beyond the Iron Curtain, and, through work and travel, few lucky ones got limited access to Western consumer goods. It appeared that this whiff of rotten capitalistic Europe was very appealing, superior in quality and design, which made all things foreign highly desirable. Not only a sign of prosperity, Although the cost of some clothes, a pair of plain jeans, for example, was exorbitant, up to one full month's salary. Possessing and wearing such items also indicated your connections, since favors and referrals were as firm a currency in the Soviet Union as were wooden rubles and green dollars. Susanna apparently knows the right man and instructs Nadia not to worry about the money, but still haggle relentlessly. The Fartsovshik's den is a display of his range, Japanese stereo system and TV, where the concert of Amanda Lear is playing. That's the material that didn't get the copyright clearance and was dubbed by a Russian jazz singer, that's why lips don't sing. 
It's really peculiar, especially since today 80s fashion has its revival, how items, most of which nowadays look casual, plain even, seem too extravagant to humble Nadia. Although this garment claimed to be real Pierre Cardin would be too much even for me. Would you have worn such an ensemble? And this phrase... Did she come from the Ural or something? In the sense of, what a country bumpkin, caused a scandal, for some women from the Siberian region took offense. The director had to compose an official letter of apology to the regional head, Boris Yeltsin, who later took part in the dissolution of the Soviet Union and became the first president of the Russian Federation. Moreover, in Bejanov's next movie, which is also about pickup, one of the main characters speaks favorably of the fairy tale land of great people and heavy industry. Nadia ends up buying dark jeans and a sweatshirt, but despite her attempts to boost the self esteem with positive affirmations, the first line of which, I am the most charming and attractive, gained the film its title, she loses the nerve and goes to work wearing her old clothes. Yet, upon Susanna's strict instructions, she gives up table tennis and at lunch break diligently sits near Valodia, who's playing chess, and compliments him clumsily. Meanwhile, notice this small detail. Claudia is preparing herself a cup of tea in a faceted glass, granioni stakan, that is as iconic a symbol of Soviet life as is this famous statue. A common myth is that both were designed by the same artist, Vera Muhina. Not true. Due to the versatility of the vessel, handy to measure out 200 and 250 milliliter of liquid, vodka, and heat resistant, the glass became an essential attribute of a stereotypical Russian night of heavy imbibing and train travel. The utensil used to boil water is another relic of pre electric kettle times, kipitilnik, immersion heater. Basically, it's an electric spiral from the kettle with a cord. It has no automatic off switch, so the user has to be vigilant and pull the plug as soon as the water starts boiling. Naturally, forgetfulness would result in water spills, burns and even fires. That's why the use of kipitelnik was outright forbidden in most public places, such as dorms, hotels and offices, but everyone smuggled them in anyway. The affirmations eventually kick in, and Nadia's new clothes cause a sensation. It's quite distressing nowadays to see how plain, casual clothes could cause such a stir, as well as a change of perception in the fashion-deficient society. Nadia also acts much more confident and continues to shower her co-workers with paid goods, which get ridiculously sophisticated names per Susanna's instructions, like Maestro and Nocturne. Madeline Klavdia notices Nadia's attempts to charm Valodia and tries to dissuade her and redirect her efforts towards Lyosha, who, in her opinion, would be a far better match. The suggestion is immediately dismissed by the Guru, him being too easy to conquer and too boring to keep. Susanna pitches the idea of a relationship that is an internal battle of wills and a fire of passion. Claudia, in turn, doesn't give up and approaches Lyosha with her matchmaking vision, giving him her own advice on how to best woo Nadia. The first of which is to clean up, for he was notoriously known for being a sloven. I have no idea why Claudia cares. Perhaps she's just bored at work and represents the nosy, I know what's best for you type of relatives slash friends slash co-workers, who were exonerated by the Soviet doctrine that it's right and noble to correct the judgment and behavior of, in your opinion, confused comrades. Everyone notices Nadia's transformation and gradually begins to treat her differently, including the abandoned table tennis partner Gena. By the way, since the actors had no prior experience with ping-pong, they were given a couple of training sessions to prepare, during one of which the actor playing Gena managed to break a toe. So, in all his scenes, he's in a cast and, like here, tries not to limp visibly. Nadia's appeal is further increased by another of Susanna's ploys. She asks her husband to pick her after work in his brand new car, which, by the way, in real life, belonged to the actor playing Lyosha. Similarly, most of the nicer clothes in the films were personal items, since the selection at the Mosfilm's costume department fully reflected the miserable state of the late Soviet Union's textile industry. Meanwhile, Nadia wriggles her way into a business trip with Misha and Valodia, to the chagrin of both men, who plan to have some fun away from home and Nadia ruins their perfect chick-baiting two-man act. Having arrived at their destination, they bribe a hotel receptionist with a chocolate bar to have Nadia assigned a room as far away from theirs as possible. 
the plan backfires since it's Nadia's random roommate whom her colleagues attempted to seduce, pretending to be wild animal tamers from the circus. Nadia ridicules the man for the rest of the trip, leaving Misha certain that she is in love with him. Upon the group's return without any progress made on the relationship's front, Susanna proposes to go all in. Invite Valodia to a concert of an Italian singer Gianni Morandi, to which she provides the tickets, and profess her love to him. Valodia, not Gianni. The concert did indeed take place in 1983 and was one of the few occasions that foreign singers toured the USSR. Somehow, the Soviet government was particularly lenient to Italian show business, streaming San Remo Music Festival live on TV, for example. That's why the performance and songs were well known and loved in the country, and tickets to such a concert were highly desirable and hard to get. Dressed in Susanna's best, the dress is allegedly from Christian Dior, Nadia is walking to the concert hall feeling on top of the world, but crashes back to the earth shortly. Valodia arrives with a girlfriend. The scene is quite despicable, as well as Valodia himself, and Nadia finally realizing it. I wonder why his girlfriend doesn't see it too, surrenders her ticket and lets them go together. Next day she is further disillusioned by her friend's scientific methods, when Susanna's husband asks her to provide cover so that he can go to a mistress. Arkady claims that he really likes and respects Susanna, but as an artist requires new emotions and the fire of passion. Nadia firmly refuses. He is further antagonized by her male colleagues, who see him as a rival. They refuse to let him drink from the water dispenser and make Lecha drink glass after glass to spite him. This scene is doubly hilarious, because in the movie Divchata that I covered previously, the same actor had to drink the entire carafe of water. The water dispenser is also of interest, here it seems to be charge-free, but usually they stood in the street and were coin-operated, providing carbonated water with various flavors. Each machine featured a single faceted glass that was often absent, stolen by some enterprising drunkard. Yet it was intended for repeated use, with the token rinds in between, a sanitary nightmare in our cautious times. Nadia says nothing to Susanna, who calls in thinking that the plan is still on, except that she loves her very much. Each of the men gives her a small present, signifying her transformation from a mousy girl to an attractive woman and everyone's heart throb. Yet, Nadia decides to give up plotting and follow her own heart and at lunch goes to play table tennis with Gena, who is delighted to see her and whom she admits to have missed very much. The end. So, was everything pointless then? I don't think so. Above all, Nadia learned to love and value herself, find happiness within and not pursue someone who doesn't deserve it. I doubt she could have done it without Susanna's help. And while some of her dating advice seems cliché and formulaic, it's not as old-fashioned as you might think. I read my share of self-help books, one of them was even called How to make anyone fall in love with you. And, I can assure you, most of the tips there were almost identical to Susanna's and might work for certain types of people pursuing certain purposes. For the clueless women of the Soviet Union, they were sensational and indeed empowering, boosting interest in psychology as well as esoteric stuff for years to come. The movie is freely available on Moss Film Studios' YouTube channel with English subtitles. The link would be in the description. I really hope that you would watch and share your opinions about this encyclopedia of the Soviet 80s, as well as dating behaviors that ultimately teaches us to make our own choices. Not that bad a lesson, and good enough to commemorate the day of female empowerment that initially was the 8th of March, the International Women's Day. Continuing the spring theme, my next video would be very fresh and uplifting. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss it. And I hope to see you then. Bye!